special edition of the Two Solitudes podcast. Uh, to start with, we uh, we came on, we logged on, Kevin and I were doing our prep for the Tim Holt USL interview, and then seven minutes before it was to start, Mr. Holt uh, contacted us, and unfortunately, uh, he's got laryngitis, and uh, he's going to have to postpone until early next week. Now, this is the second postponement we've had, uh, so some people out there are going to be going, oh, guys, are you just feeding us a line? We're really not. Uh, Mr. Holt feels really bad about this. Uh, we have all of our, our, our questions ready to go and your questions ready to go, and we'll get to that early next week. But Kevin and I, we're not going to tell you when it's going to happen until it happens now because two cancellations means that we don't want to be the boy who cried about the Holt. But it doesn't matter. We'll still have a... Very interesting show, CONCACAF Champions League show, Dwayne. I had a heck of a week. You did, and there's video of you, apparently, right? Yeah, if you go on the Impact's Montreal uh, YouTube channel, there's a video of the viewing party, and guess who's jumping after the first goal? Yeah, you can see me all front and center. Um, I was not jumping up and down as much. I, I had no issue with the impact. I, I tweeted good for them. Um, I hardly I watched the whole game. It was a an intriguing uh, performance by the impact. We'll get into that uh, a lot deeper in the, the second segment right after this break. We're also going to talk about um, DC United's performance and MLS's performance overall over the past. In that, I'm going to talk about how maybe it's arguable that the Champions League. Uh, they call it the Champions League. Like we, we don't need a qualifier on that. Like it's the Champions League. <laughs> Whether the Concacaf Champions League is uh, more popular in Canada than anywhere else in the region, there's an argument to be made there, and there's some um, you know, anecdotal evidence that maybe there there is a bit of that going on. So we'll talk about that, and then in our final segment, we're going to talk about the possibility of a Canadian league. I have a bit of a brief update on that. I was going to save that to the whole interview to add it to after that, but. Uh, I figure I've been teasing it for a little while now, so I might as well put it out there. It's not a major update, but it's a little bit update of what I heard in the last week. And then I thought we'd have a bit of an MLS Labor 101. There's a lot of misconceptions, Kevin, about what labor unions are and what they aren't. And because so many, so few people, I think, nowadays are actively involved or have been involved in unions, they don't understand basic concepts and basic strategies that might happen in a labor situation. So uh, not that we're going to get the, you know, the chalkboard out and take you to school here, but we thought we'd have a bit of a conversation as it relates to the, to the MLS labor dispute and to help people maybe hopefully understand a little bit about how, you know, the world of union works and, and use the right terminology and things like that so that uh, we're having a conversation on the same level. Uh, before all that, uh, Kevin, have you recovered from, uh, from your party there the other night? It took me a couple of hours, if not a couple of days, but I finally recovered. The one thing that I just can't believe, it, it wasn't a dream. It wasn't a dream. Fine, they got two goals and they got tied before the end of the game, but getting two goals away to start a game in Mexico by your team, it, it's one of the only things I was not expecting heading to Tuesday night. Yeah, it, it, well, no one was, really. Uh, the 2-0 uh, lead was something that came out of blue, but... Um... Hey, good for you. I still got a whole 90 minutes to play. I don't think Pinchuk is going to come out quite as flat, but maybe we'll talk a bit more about that in uh, the next segment. I think, uh, we've only had five weeks of preseason, and to come into this game against a team that's in midseason form, I think it's a real good result. Is the, uh, was the altitude a problem in the second half? Yeah, I mean, I mean, like I said, we have five weeks of preseason. The altitude definitely affects you, but I thought uh, our staff did a good job bringing us out here two weeks early. You have scored two goals. Uh, what's your feeling about it? You know what? I, I really didn't think about it as, as the game was played. But because uh, all week we've been focused on just getting a result, and that's all we were thinking about, and that's what I was thinking about during the game. Which will be the key in the second game? The key in the second game is uh, to play similar to what we did today, play as a unit and uh, move forward and defend as a unit, and I think we, we should do well. Thank you, Lily. Thank you. And welcome back to our extra special CCL edition of the Two Solitudes podcast. Kevin Laramie in Drawtorius, Montreal. How are you doing, Kevin? Uh, has it has it sunk in yet, the draw? It did. And what surprised me, it's all the new players. The, a lot of people are talking about the 12 new players in the team and how it's going to be hard for them to gel. Those 17 days before the game in Mexico did it wonders for that. And you saw it on the pitch. The most influential players in that game were 
The new bunch of new guys talk about uh, Laurent Simon in the defense with Bakary Soumari who impressed me. They controlled everything in the air, which is surprising because a lot of crosses and a lot of corners in that game. And Montreal was effective on almost every one of them. And then obviously Dilutuka is new from lad, middle of last year, but Dilutuka had a career performance, Dwayne. A, a player who never scored two goals in an MLS or CONCACAF before scores twice in a uh, no tomorrow game. It's a uh, it was a great day. It, yeah, certainly Duca got the headlines with the two goals. Although I thought the second goal was as much map as Duca, yeah. but uh, and, and Justin Map's a guy we've talked about a lot on this show in terms of uh, his under his over under appreciation. I think league wide. Um, yeah, he just just a guy that had a great year last year for a team that struggled. Now there has been in the days that have followed. There's been a lot of people that have uh, expanded the uh, performance by the impact down in Montreal to mean something about the MLS season. Does does do you having seen them play down there? Do you have a greater level of confidence about the impact's ability to compete in MLS this year? Nope, no, Dwayne. And now uh, the best way to explain this is when you have a lot of time. To focus for one game or to focus for one simple moment of a performance like they, they were focused for two weeks in mexico for that first leg game that's all they drink that's all they drink that's all they ate that's all they thought about was that game so it, it reminds me of a boxer who has a training camp prepares for one particular boxing adversary and has the right who has the right, uh, what's it called, uh, the preparation for that single opponent, and he's trying to find the weakness. But it doesn't necessarily correlate to the other opponent in that league. So what would your message be to uh, those that are proclaiming, uh, you know, top three for the impact, which I've actually seen out there? Uh, yeah, they're, I wouldn't go that far at all. I would say uh, normal. I would say I would, that doesn't change my expectation at all. For me, Montreal is still different right now it, it, season is different than what they're doing right now it's the CONCACAF right now they're focused on one goal uh, the overall aspect of playing 34 games in the championship it, that's a long ways to go fair, fair enough um the, in terms of you, you mentioned the the newer players uh, Simone having maybe the most impact and I thought that to, forgive the pun um that's the easy pun to make though isn't it yeah. at any rate uh forgive the uh the, that but uh Obviously, he was a standout, but beyond that, is there someone that was a bit of a dark horse underdog, underappreciated, that you thought had a great game that uh, that should be highlighted? Yeah, for me, there's Bakary Soumare, because I was, I've said on this show and on Outworks many times, he was a reckless player in Major League Soccer for many years before this season with Chicago, and we were not expecting him to be that solid defensively and being calm in a way. He needs to control his emotion. He got a yellow card in that game, but never made a move that let either like a doubt is going to get sent off or let, never made a harsh or a bad decision while doing a tackle. And I think that fair as well. It's only one game. We, the, the amount of data we have for those players are still just 90 minutes. So we have to be careful how we project that in the future. But after one game, I'm surprised with Soumare. But I have to say, real Coker, defensively, really impressive and and it really brings me back. He looked like the real Coker with Vancouver and not the one with Chivas. So that fares well as well. It, yeah, it's it's interesting. It, it, I, I think that Toronto fans should know well and uh, about how sometimes CCL play is different than MLS play too. And I think that's something Impact fans would be – they should really understand and, and try and embrace. Uh, there were players – Julian Guzman might be a perfect example here in Toronto who had some brilliant games in the CCL. And, of course, we all know how he did in MLS. He struggled from the get-go because of the difference in styles. So I'm not saying that that's going to happen. Um, I'm just saying that you need to, you know, take a step back sometimes from the excitement. But you should also enjoy the excitement. So let's move forward there on that. Um, for speaking to next week, Kevin, how much excitement has grown from that result down there? A lot. Close to 4,000 tickets were sold since the end of the game on Tuesday night. So in three days, you get almost one-fifth of the ticket you sold already just in three days. So I expect maybe another 10,000 tickets to be sold before the end of the game, well, before the start of the game, to maybe at the end of the game, you get close to 30,000, which is my prediction uh, 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 during the last couple of weeks. So 30,000 is what you're hoping from there. Is it getting more media attention? Yes, it is. Uh, 
nobody in Montreal were expecting that type of result in, in Mexico, for that matter, too. You spoke about, in Montreal, there's a lot of attention now. Oh, the team's finally had a good result. And it, some of the fans say, okay, they finally showed us something. It's time we can take our wallets out, take some money, and go to the stadium. Some people have that feeling. Some people have a feeling like we knew all along with the changes that Adam Bryson in the, the off season. But for a lot of people, it's just... It, it, It's not just a training camp result. It's not just a bottom of the news sticker like, okay, the Impact are playing in two weeks at the stadium, get your tickets. It, it's, it's real now. It, you can touch it. You can see it. You can smell it. And that means that Montreal are a late crowd, and I think it's going to bring them out. So you're basically, you're on page 32 now after 31 pages of, uh, of Habs coverage before it was page 50? <laughs> yeah, close to that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm well, they had imagine. some headlines on Tuesday night, even though the Habs won. Some news outlet had the impact as the first sports news. It didn't stay that for long, but it lasted for a little while. I, I'm in a, at a city where there's, uh, you know, glaring 72 point headlines over David Clarkson getting traded last night. So at any rate, <sighs> um, if you don't know who David Clarkson is, that's probably you're you're a better person than I am. At any rate, we move on. Um, in terms of the the second leg. Uh, Do you have do you, what do you expect, Kevin? Just what do, what do you think is going to happen in that second leg? I think Pachuca is not going to get caught twice. I think they got, were not expecting maybe the amount of pressure Montreal did, or maybe the amount of opportunity. Because not going to lie, Montreal don't have that amount of opportunity to score. They had like three, and Duca finished on two. I think they were not expecting the amount of defense that Montreal were able to do. I think Sima and Bagari Soumari are the reason why Montreal were able to get a result in that game, even though the second goal could say is a confusion between the goalkeeper and the defense, and it's normal when you have a new defense and a goalkeeper that don't know each other. They, those mistakes are expected. And I'm, I'm, it's better for me that it happens now than six months from now. But going back to that, uh, Soumare and Sima are like it, another easy pun to say. It's a concrete in the midfield with Sima, but them in the middle of the defense... They're able to just, they're taller than everybody else. They jump higher. And yes, it's a Mexican team. It was different than MLS team size-wise. But still, I was impressed by the play of those two. And I think that's the key. If they can continue to do that in Montreal, if it's cold, that's going to help too. I'm not going to lie. If it's like minus 30, I'll take it for that day. All that could, with the intangibles of the home field advantage. We always talk about it, especially on this show about the turf and all that. I think it can have an impact, but... Pachuca's not going to get caught twice. They come here, they know what they ex to expect now. And I believe, yeah, they had 8 out of 11 starters which played on Tuesday, which played on Saturday the day before, but they're their A team. I expect them to get a break tomorrow in the IMAX and be 100% on Tuesday. What I've heard is interesting from a Pachuca perspective is as much as we view Pachuca as one of their top teams over the past four or five years, uh, they actually have struggled since 2013, I believe, is yeah. when the, the, their struggles started to go downhill. And if you look at the way the Mexican League does their relegation, it's over a running period. And depending on how other results shake out, and we all know that Chivas Guadalajara is oddly in a relegation battle there, but uh, if the wrong team goes down and you put – Uh, Penchuca's results over the past three years into that mix next year, they could actually be in a relegation battle next year. So I heard a Mexican um, commentator suggest that that might be one reason why uh, they may play, especially on poor surface in Montreal, take it a little less seriously. So that might be um, something to look for there. Speaking of the surface, the one thing I would wonder is ironically whether Montreal's hyper preparation on the first leg in Mexico might actually Uh, put them on an equal footing when they go back to Montreal and play on that uh, horrific surface that they're going to play on at Olympic Stadium. They did practice for two weeks at the Olympic Stadium before traveling to Mexico. So they did establish uh, the Mexican, the, the Montreal training camp in the Big O, which they never do. They did in the big stadium to get ready before they leave to Mexico and back here. So they did have a solid three weeks of training on the plastic pitch before they traveled down to Mexico. And how do you think that Montreal's players will stock up on that pitch? How, how do you think that the, um, the the play will be affected by it? It's a very quick surface. Uh, if memory serves, uh, at least I assume that the surface is similar to what mm -hmm. the last time they played on there. Uh, a lot of big bounces. There's going to be, it, it's hard to play with any nuance down the wings. It's, it's more of a direct game. 
Uh, do you think that uh, Montreal has the players to, to, to play that system? I think we might. You just lob it through ball forward. Hope Dominic Adderu is the first on the ball. You hope he keeps possession, but then he can be dangerous because he's going to be faster than all the other guys. I, I think they finally have a striker who played that type of play. Devayo couldn't play that type of soccer. He doesn't have the skills or the attributes, or a different type of uh, skill set. But Dama Duro could be the guy for that, target man type. Yeah, Duro. Duro had some great uh, first touches there in that first game. He yeah. had some very Duro touches. I hope you uh, uh, watch them and, uh, and absorb them and understand that you're going to see them all year. Just a, just a pre-warning there. That's, uh, that's the Duro touch. Yeah, but, but, but the one time that he's going to do it, though, he's so fast, he's always open. You need to keep possession of the ball first. Yeah, there you go. You know when you're playing FIFA, Dwayne, and you're just some passing <laughs> to each other, but you hold that damn turbo button a little too long and the ball goes a little too far every time? Well, that's Dama Duro. Yeah, when I play FIFA, usually I'm losing 5-0 to someone, so that's fine. Um, you know, I, Panchuka can't be as bad in the second leg. Uh, I, I think that's a fair thing to think. I, I, look, I don't mean to take anything away from Montreal. Obviously, they went in and they did what they needed to do. They did a hell of a lot more than DC United did, and uh, we're going to talk about them in a minute. So full credit to them. I think it's credit to the organization for taking the tournament seriously, for doing what it needed to do to prepare for the tournament in a serious way. So they deserve a lot of credit there. But I do think that there's that Panchuka was caught a little off guard by the intensity that Montreal brought. Um, and we saw in the second half that they do have some skilled players. Now, the thing is, Away goals are back in the in the play for a CONCACAF Champions League this year. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is an advantage to Montreal. If they can nick one, they're really in an advantage because a 1-1 draw would advance Montreal, uh, apparently, to play in Costa Rica. So Yeah, exactly. It could be <laughs> a, a luck, Dwayne, from, for a Canadian team that usually if you win the quarterfinals, you go to the semis, you'll have another big Mexican team. Or if you're really lucky, you'll get an MLS team. Or maybe... I was looking at the DC game, expecting DC to do better, but you know what? The Costa Rican team is still some levels below the type of level that Pachuca is, so it could be interesting if Montreal gets out of that of that uh, game. Uh, yeah, and we're going to talk about Ella Walensi. Ella yeah. Walense? I always say it wrong. It's the it's a non saprisa team in Costa Rica. At any rate, uh, Kevin, before we do that, um, prediction? A 1-1 uh, draw at the big O. You think that Montreal is going to Costa Rica then? Yes. Well, unless you, well, unless DC United scores three goals, I guess wins by three, then then, well, that then could, it might that change. could happen. They're playing an RFK, so you never know what could happen. It's going to be cold. You never know. You never know. All right, uh, let's talk about the DC five two. They lost for those that don't know. Um, they didn't do any prep down there. Complete opposite in a lot of ways of what Montreal did. Now they did score two away goals. Uh, I guess you could spin that into some kind of positive, I guess. Yeah, but they conceded five. So yeah. <laughs> that's I don't the know thing. If you can... The funny thing is the MLSsoccer.com, the, the article on the thing is they started with there's no way to sugarcoat the DC United's 5-2 loss. And then two paragraphs later they go, but, but... it was preseason. <laughs> it was preseason, which is always the thing that the MLS teams do. Um, the first rule of MLS and CCL is you have to always point out it's that they're in preseason. That that seems to be the first rule. And it, it's starting to become a little bit of an excuse, in my opinion. Um, yes, it is a preseason competition. But you know what? The CCL starts when the other parts of the of the region are in their preseason. And I don't see the, the um, Mexican teams losing to uh, MLS teams too often in the August. Do you? No, true. And it's true. The... What happened? What's happening to the Canadian and American team now? Happens to the Mexican and the other team in August. So it's it's uh, it's fair that way. And if you watched the Champions League this week, you saw you know uh, a couple good results from from teams that or Europa League from that play in climates that are, are northern and take breaks at winter and all that sort of stuff. They figure out how to get it done. It obviously is a challenge. Uh, whenever you're playing international uh, club competitions, there's always going to be different quirks to different parts of the world that you're going to have to overcome. Um, MLS too often leans on that excuse of the preseason thing a little bit too hard, in my opinion. You can't go down and have five goals hung on you. Okay. And, and you can't go down and expect anything if you didn't prepare for it, right? No, exactly. That's the one big difference. Montreal took 17 days out of the Montreal training camp to be in Mexico. They... 
It's hundreds of thousands of dollars when you think about it that the club invested in the preparation of the team heading into that game. And you can say they reaped the rewards of that. And DC United did the exact opposite, and you can say they reaped the rewards of their preparation too. It, and I always often wonder, it, it, and the point I was going to make, I, I teased it in the, the intro, um, it's now the CONCACAF Champions League has been title branded, and it's been title branded by a bank. Scotia Bank. bank is Scotia Bank, the Bank of Nova Scotia, which is an odd sponsorship <laughs> yeah. for this. But if you've ever traveled in the Caribbean or, or Central America, then you'll know that Scotia Bank has a presence down there. Um, so it's not completely out to lunch, but it is a Canadian bank. And I think it's telling that it's a Canadian bank because I think the Canadian teams, by and large, have year after year proven that they care about this competition more than the American MLS teams. And in some cases, more than the Mexican teams. Mexican teams are just so much better that they win, right? Like, it's not that if you look at some of the lineups they put out in the, in the round robins phase of this game, it's like essentially they're youth teams. So. You know, there, there's a bit of a, a lack of care there, and the, if you look in the general, in the, like the crowd, like you look at like the crowd at Pachuca, it was hardly you know busting at the seams in there, wasn't it? No, nope. and even Pachuca is known to be one of the very, the sports are not quiet, but they have a very mellow attitude. They're not antagonistic like other Mexican supporters can be. They're known to be a quiet bunch, a, a nice type of people bunch, not a a rowdy bunch. But even people didn't come out for that game. There was barely, I was going to say half. Because on paper, that's what they said. It was half full, but it looked like a quarter full to me. Yeah, and if you go to other parts of the region, I remember TFC playing the the teams in Panama, and there was like friends and family there. <laughs> There's ridiculously small crowds in some of these places, so this competition just doesn't have any traction. If you look at the highest highest attended games in CCL history, the top two are in Canada, and one's in Montreal, the big old game that we uh, we all remember. Uh, well, some of us remember more fondly than others, but uh, <laughs> certainly a, a very seminal game in Canadian club, recent Canadian club uh, soccer history. And uh, the other one, of course, is the LA Galaxy game here at Skydome in, in Toronto. Sorry, Rogers Center here in uh, Toronto. It's Skydome. So, yeah, it's always the Skydome. I don't know why they didn't call it the Rogers Skydome. That, that's the one thing that irritates people. Uh, people understand branding, but why didn't they just call it the Rogers Skydome? That would have worked, right? Yep. Anyway, I digress. Um, and they would have got Rogers out more, too, if they've done that. Now people are like, you know, political about it that they refuse to call it the Rogers Center where if they just called it the Rogers Skydome people would have called it the Rogers Skydome and anyway I, I really digress now <laughs> so the biggest two attendants there are those two games so what's that say about the competition and what's that say about us in Canada I, I think it's it's kind of oh, we're suckers that, for tournaments Ooh. yeah or maybe it is and this has been always my deep I don't know sociological theory on this is because we play and we're guests in the Americans League in, a, in essence, in MLS, that we kind of take the international competition more seriously, that we want to prove ourselves as Canadian clubs, as fans of Canadian clubs, even though there's no Canadians on the teams, and we'll talk about that in the next <laughs> segment. Um, we want to prove ourselves. We want to be real. We want to be accepted as being legitimate. We, we want, want to belong. Closure. We want to belong We somewhere. want to belong. So it's just another opportunity. Going deep in the CCL is like, see, we're just as good. We take this more seriously. And it, you know, as much as the uh, American MLS fans generally ignore the three Canadian teams for the most part, as soon as the CCL rolls around, you'll be damn right that if Montreal advances to the semifinal. And what's it going to be? IM, IMFC uh, for – what's it what they used to do? RSL for all or what, what was the MLS hashtag? R- RSL for all, yeah. Yeah, or something like that. Yeah. MLS for our, uh, RSL, that was what it MLS was. MLS for RSL, yes, yeah, true. And so will it be impact for uh, MLS? I don't know, <laughs> MLS making impact? I, I don't know. That's not going to fly too too well within the TFC uh, fan base, I don't think. <laughs> but at, at any rate, um, it's just interesting how quickly they'll adopt that. But uh, I just thought that was an interesting quirk. But in terms of, of MLS taking – do you think, Kevin, that MLS really does want to win? They always say. They're saying the right things. You listen to the right owners. They are. We're really taking the CCL seriously. I hear that all the time on Extra Time Radio and all that. These owners come on and they ah, oh, you know, we really want to do it well in the CCL. Well, that's all fine and dandy, but you got to prove it, right? Like, don't listen to what I say. Watch what I do is the adage that I would use there. And there's not a lot of evidence that the American – either they're really, really slow learners or they don't really care. That's That's – what I would come for when it comes to the American MLS teams in this competition. There's not a lot of evidence that they that they do care, do you think? Here's an evidence. Montreal did have helping hand from MLS to help plan and prepare for the trip and everything that went down in Mexico, Dwayne. To, 
the MLS's network of contacts, it's a little bigger. The Rolodex is bigger than the Montreal Impact's one. And for once, they did take advantage of that for the preparation for the, for the CCL. So there's a small evidence that they might do take it seriously and eventually do really want to win it because it's all a question of perception. Reality is a question of perception. And if you want to be, in reality, one of the best teams and best leagues in the world, well, in perception, you have to be able to, you have to look like you're doing everything you can to help your clubs achieve on a big stage. Yeah, it- I, I agree. There, I think there are. It's it's not nuanced enough of me to say that no one cares in MLS. There are people that do. There are American fans that clearly care, and they're probably listening to us because let's face it: if they're taking the time, if you American listener are taking the time to seek out the Canadian MLS podcast, you care about the international perception and things like that. Like you do, you're likely a fan of the CCL. So I get that. I get you. You're out there, but your numbers aren't as big as the numbers that don't care. I would even argue that numbers that don't care here in Canada are bigger than the ones that do. It's just that there's a few more that do. It's We're kind of getting into numbers and things that can't be proven here when we have these conversations. But, you know, putting aside my underlying belief that, uh, that, MLS would need to change it dramatically, change how it structures its teams before it truly wins an international club competition. I do think that there there needs to be. It's telling to me that the two deep runs, other than RSL, that have gone in this competition have been Canadian teams that were quite literally the worst teams in MLS the year before. So, um, or in Toronto's case, they were the worst team in the MLS while it was going on. In Montreal's case, they were the worst team in MLS last year. And we're not talking about subjectively. We're talking about objectively here. I think it's telling that if you put a little bit of effort into this preparation, you put a little bit of attention into it, that you do do okay. So that, what does that say? If the LA Galaxy ever actually tried, would they not go deeper? That's kind of where I'm going with here. Yeah, you know what they say about chasing two rabbits at the same time, Dwayne, eh? You don't yeah. catch one. And, and there's truth to that, too, uh, that Toronto qualified for the knockout stage in a year when their their season was done. And then they were able to focus. They were on an 0-9 start. So they were able to, to basically put all their eggs in there because this another season was down the drain before it got going. So it's, it's an interesting conversation there. Um, all right. Uh, Let's take a quick break. We'll come back, and I'm going to break down a little bit of Canadian League news, and we'll talk a bit about the CBA. Thanks for listening to the Two Solitude Sucker Podcast with Kevin Laramie and Dwayne Rollins. You can reach the guys on Twitter at 24th Minute and at Kevin Laramie, or both of them at Two Solitudes Pod. Reach the guys on email, twosolitudespodcast at gmail.com, but especially subscribe on Stitcher Radio. Now back to the show. And welcome back. I guess the way to start here, and this sort of segues out of our last segment, is um, after the game was over, or well, during the game, really, there was a lot of Twitter discussion amongst certain people uh, that have this Twitter discussion 15 times a year on the Twitters, including myself, about the fact that the Montreal Impact, despite flying the Canadian flag and wearing it on their sleeve, uh, one of the last times we'll see the Canadian flag in the sleeve, the new MLS jerseys do not have the jerseys on, or the flags on them anymore. Um, didn't have a single Canadian player make the pitch. Uh, now, what does that say about the state of Canadian soccer and MLS and how it relates to MLS, Kevin? Um, as real to, I don't think it says anything, Dwayne, because we knew it's the case and we're not expecting it to be different. We're, there's no quotas involved in Major League Soccer, so, so we don't have that mentality that the Mexican do have. Let's take that example, because there was a lot of reporters from Mexico, from Pachuca, to be honest, a lot of beat reporters that were saying that, yeah, it's, you don't have any players. Us here, we have quotas. Like, eight out of 11 starters sometimes have to be Mexican. It's like, the, it, And so a lot of times, it's 11 out of 11 that are Mexican, to be honest. But they still have the quotas are there. But... Here, the you can say the pool or the basin of players are not big enough or not talented enough. It's just the fact that we're not there yet. Mexico, uh, it's a different, totally different mindset. But even the United States, at the beginning, when the beginning of uh, an ASL, the majority of the team were made of people from outside. It's that's how a league begins. And when you're looking at, yeah, Major League Soccer has been there for 20 years, but no, the Canadian side of Major League Soccer, the three teams, been there for uh, now uh, nine years now, Toronto. It's the ninth year, yeah. The ninth year, so nine, four, and th- and five. So it, it's still going to take some time, I think. 
yes and no. Um, <laughs> here's the thing. First off, this idea that there aren't that it would be absurd or horrible for the CSA to demand that there be a greater Canadian quota in MLS. It, it, there's no absurdity to that whatsoever. As as the Mexican uh, reporters pointed out, it's common in many parts of the world. The only reason that we don't see it as common here in Canada is because what we're exposed to is primarily England. And England, although it does have a homegrown rule, it's so loosely defined that it doesn't really affect the ability to play non-English players. So that's our biggest uh, exposure. And also, uh, there's a lot of Scottish fans out here that they don't have, they have similar kind of exposure things that going on there and how good Scottish football doing at any rate, I, I digress. The thing is, in a lot of smaller places, a lot of smaller countries, that's how they address it. It's how they address the shortcoming in talent, that they force them to be local. And it's not just about national, too, especially in the Canadian context. It's about a local thing. Like, if you're from Vancouver and you're screaming, like, it's not the Whitecaps' role to, to, to support Canadian soccer, well, maybe not. But it, shouldn't it not be, if they're a club that represents their community, should it not be their role to... Uh, enhance local soccer in the Vancouver and the lower mainland area, which includes providing opportunities for kids to truly advance to the senior team. Like, I mean, there's, there's a lot of stuff out there like that. And I don't want to get into that side of it because it isn't, it's a chicken and egg thing. It isn't really the fault of the Mm -hmm. technical staff on game day for playing their best 11. It isn't. I get that that the impact are going to go down there and they're going to, you know, I think Bernier is going to get some time. We're going to get some of those young kids at the back are going to get some time this year. They will have Canadian minutes that happen, but on any given game day, they're going to take the roster that's in front of them. They're going to pick their best 11 players. That's going to happen in Vancouver. That's going to happen in Toronto. That's going to happen in Montreal. The problem to me lies in the fact that the CSA has been too loose in allowing the MLS teams to control the agenda, the narrative, to get the quota so low. It's three players, and they're loosely defined as anything that has any sort of green card attachment to Canada. Green card's an American term, I understand, but you know what I'm talking about. Work permit, yeah. Yeah, that it's, it's relatively useless. To me... We need to take a hard look at whether MLS is helping Canadian soccer at this point. And to me, it's not. When TFC broke into the league, they were required, and I believe it was eight, they were required to have eight Canadians on the lineup. They found, and they weren't very good in 2007. (laughs) However, were they that much worse than they were in 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011? No, they weren't really. They they still had a lot of international players. Danny Dicchio could still come from England and become a TFC legend. It wasn't preventing the club from, from embracing parts of the rest of the part of the world. They just had to carry eight Canadians. And I often lament the fact in the second year when TFC was able to lobby that number down, and I think it went down to five and then eventually four, and then eventually they allowed the – actually, it stayed at five for a while, but they allowed some Americans to count. They added American spots, and then when Vancouver came in, that's when they tried to lobby it, uh, and it was mostly coming from the West Coast. And, folks, this is where my distaste of the left coast comes from in this context. Uh, they wanted to get down to two players, and then the CSA put their foot down on two, but they could only get it up to three. So – this is where we're at right now. Had TFC been had not been successful to lower that and we, we had had this remained at eight, would we not be better off right now today? Yeah, TFC might have struggled for a couple of years. Spoiler alert, they struggled for a couple of years anyway. And by a couple, I mean eight. <laughs> so, No, I, I understand what you mean, Dwight. I understand totally. That we have a lot more Canadian players being in the level that we have a national team. They'll be uh, probably a decade further than they are right now compared to the other teams. That's all true. But there's a question for you, Dwayne. We all know that the... Oh, sorry, Dwayne. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, you finish it off. We all know that the be-all, end-all is having a Canadian 1A type league for Canadian players with quotas and stuff. But right now, that's not the case. What's the what's the road? What's the goal between the two? Because it's not going to happen tomorrow morning. What should we do to help the Canadian quotas, the amount of Canadian players, that aspect of it, before there's an actual one A league can, totally Canadian? Yeah, it, it, this teases into the to what I was saying before. And what I've talked in the last day is that 
you know, I reported several months ago that the NASL, the CFL, and uh, the CSA were in talks to maybe create uh, a Canadian what, 1A league, and that's something the CSA basically confirmed to me and to others after the fact that the, the talks had happened on some level, but they were uh, a ways off. Since that time, um, basically what's happened is that the NASL has put this on their back burner, which has caused uh, the CSA to look in other directions. And I had that confirmed to me for a while that although they haven't given up on the idea that the NASL will play an important role in the creation of a Canadian league, the idea of them housing it under their label has somewhat fallen behind. And this is kind of new and, and disappointing from my perspective news that has come out in the last couple of weeks to me. Uh, so that is a change. And what they've done is they still haven't given up on this. They are looking on different directions. They still do believe in the need for this. So it's not like the CSA has stopped these kind of conversations. But the like I said, the NASL has put it on, quote unquote, their back burner for now. So there's your update, your depressing update. Um, what my belief is, and I'm, I'm going into speculation right now, is that, uh, is that the CSA believes that their only true – way out of the woods is to get is to have like an explosive like basically how MLS happened is that they they got the World Cup 24. and they were forced to, to a one division one league so I think the CSA feels the same way that the only impetus to ever create a Canadian league to get people off their ass and doing things rather than just saying what we can't do is to have a World Cup and that's why they're putting so much into that 26 bid in my opinion is that they think that that's what's needed and the 26 bid would happen around 17, 18, somewhere in there. So you're looking at maybe a, a Canadian 1A league starting in 2019, 2020. That's still a ways off. And obviously that these MLS teams and the USL teams and all that are going to have a major role to play in the meantime in the next two cycles. So we might as well just put the Hail Mary belief out of our mind right now and look at what we have. And what we have right now are nine protected Division I uh, Canadian slots. And no protected slots, no access, no slots at all in the U.S. We've talked about that issue to death. Um, what I've been told is that – I've been told conflicting things on the Canadian quota spot in the U.S. right now as part of the CBA. There are many that are suggesting that something is happening. There are others that are telling me that, some, that the CSA has basically given up on MLS ever helping them. And they, what they need to do at this point in time is focus on what they can control and what they can control are the Canadian teams, which is why I go back to the Canadian quota thing and why I'm talking about the Canadian quotas. If it comes out of the CBA negotiations, Kevin, that we do not have a change in the way Canadians are treated in the U.S., which I agree is the ideal solution, is to have them created, have them labeled as domestics in the U.S. That would open up the most slots, that would provide the most opportunity. But if that does not happen, then we need to seriously understand that the U.S. Uh, league – is not going to help us and that we need to help ourselves. And the one way that they can do that is they can, the CSA can demand as part of their sanctioning because they do control the hammer here that the Canadian MLS teams start to increase their quota. I'm not going to put them in a spot where they're immediately going to go from competitive teams to finishing, you know, with four points or something. You're not going to have to play all Canadians all the time. But I do think that there should be a plan put in place very quickly that increases that quota, that starts to increase that quota from three to four to five to back to the eight that TFC had in the first day. That's what I believe needs to happen now. And we need to have a plan. The Canadian, the MLS teams in Canada will counter that by saying, it's the academy is going to figure this out by themselves. Eventually, the academy is going to make everything better. Look, we have these USL pro teams. It's going to give them a chance, and eventually, they, they, we're not going to need a quota because there's going to be all these Canadians out there. Bullshit. Without need to do it, they will always find an excuse, and I'm talking about all three teams. They will always find an excuse to play someone else over a young Canadian until they need to, need to get that quota up. We're not going to get help from the U.S., I don't think. We need to start dealing with our own issues, and this is the number one way we can do so. With those USL teams, though, play devil's advocate for a second, in a way, it is going to bring more Canadian players that didn't have a starting 11 type of minutes with the team they are right now. They will with their USL counterparts. Do you think it's like four or five years from now, and it could... Could that problem be on a different level without changing anything? Just with the fact that there will be a couple of more players, if not like one or two per team, that will be at a different level because of those USL Pro teams. You'd hope, but we're still talking about the USL Pro. How many USL Pro, pro players are on the U.S. national team? Here, to me, this is, I'll give you a we talk about none. Just, Exactly. How many would ever be considered? They're have, losing their mind over the fact that an <laughs> NASL player got a look. Yeah, I know. Okay? So let's be honest here. 
we talked about Justin Mapp earlier in the show. If let me ask you a question: If Justin Mapp was Canadian, would he be a Canadian national team player? He'll be starting damn, in every single game. Damn right he would be. He'd be captain. <laughs> He is a product of MLS having a domestic requirement in the U.S. for years. He is. He's absolutely. The U.S. does require an American quota down there. So I don't understand why there's so much resistance here from fans. I get it from, from the teams because they're right. There would be a slight slip back if they were forced overnight to add five Canadians to the roster. They would lose their overall depth and talent. They wouldn't lose their overall depth in the top 11, but they would have slightly less strong bench, right? Yeah. So they would be a little bit worse off the top. But like I said, had we been consistent about this for eight years now, coming on to nine, it's my thought that they wouldn't that the issue wouldn't be as big right now. That they would we would have twenty four Canadians that could be contributors in MLS because they would have been forced into the role and they would have grown into that role. But alas, we uh we 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 switch and we dream about the Justin Maps of the goddamn world, which we're dreaming about Justin Map. Let's think about it. this is the state of Canadian soccer, is that we wish Justin Map was Canadian. Yeah, you should know me better every day I dream of Justin Map anyways, Dwayne. Every day you dream of Justin Map. And on that note, folks <laughs> <laughs> Yep, when you can't top something, uh, that's when you finish uh, the show. <laughs> all right. Okay, uh, how do I segue out of that? Um, we're going to uh, talk a bit about the, the labor situation in the in the MLS right now. This is an extra show, folks. I didn't expect quality here. Come on, what do you want out of this? Yeah, but you uh, were saying off air how uh, you're surprised how people are, are not aware of the, the right terminology and the right way an actual labor dispute works. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it has to do with, and I don't want to get political about this, but over the past 30, 40 years, there has been an erosion of trust and belief in the idea of labor unions. So that in turn has had created a misunderstanding of how they work. So we get basic concepts like what the difference between a strike and a lockout aren't understand, understood. We get even basic people asking questions like whether – I saw this on Reddit the other day, whether, uh, uh, US, whether MLS teams couldn't just send all their players to the USL. Well <laughs> – you, you can't because they're in a union, folks. Like it's not the league per se. It's not the players of the league. They are the league that they're playing in that dictates whether they're in a strike position. It's the fact that they're part of a union. And, and this kind of concept's not understood, right? And you know, for those that don't know, and I think that this has been explained a few times, but really quickly, the difference between a strike and a lockout is is simple. It's who initiates the work stoppage. If the owners initiate it, it's a lockout. Figuratively, you're being locked out of the plant. Right. Mm -hmm. If the uh, owners or if the players initiated, it's a strike. So as it relates to this, why would what's the difference? Why would one strategically do it and the other? What is happening right now is that for those that don't know, is that the players have may had a vote that puts them in a strike position. Um, that generally means that they have the, their membership, which is everyone who belongs to the union, has voted to give permission to their executive committee, which are the people that are negotiating on their behalf, which are player reps, to vote to strike. So they have taken – and what usually what happens is a union too. Once the, the executive votes to strike, they would still take it back to the union and have another vote to verify the strike uh, initiative from the, the executive. But they're in a position now that if they want, if they believe that the, the negotiations have got to a point of no return, that they can walk away from the negotiating table and say, we are now withdrawing our work. We're withdrawing our services from you, the owners. It's the same as if you're building or making tires, right? If you're a tire maker and your owner is refusing to budge on your uh, – your desire for health care, you can then refuse to work for that owner, thus refusing, thus stopping him from making tires, thus stopping him from making money off the selling of those tires. That's the only power you have as a worker. That's the basic concept here. It's what the players will do. They will then walk away if they feel that's the only way that they can get the owners to take their issue seriously. Now, in some cases and in the bigger sports, we've had lockouts. The reason the MLS – or other leagues lock out is because they want to control when the work stoppage happens. Why would that make sense? Why would they want to control it now? If, Why wouldn't they just continue playing right now? Because they like the current negotiation. And for those that don't know, the CBA as, that has expired remains in place effectively in a legal level while they are negotiating so long as they are negotiating. Okay? Why would they do that? To control again. It's about strategy. If they allow the players to enter the season in a lockout position, in a, sorry, in a strike position, 
then the players could, in at the All Star game, pull out. They could play out of the eve of the playoffs. They could pull out whatever the most attention is on the league, and that puts the league in a worse position. It also allows the players, in that particular case, to save up to have a greater strike fund so that they can eat during the lockout, right? Yep. So that's kind of where I was coming from here. What do I think is going to happen? I'm increasingly thinking, Kevin, that uh, that there's going to be a work stoppage of some kind. So that's where I'm coming from. If you're looking at the signs between the lines, and uh, I'll give a little hint to every MLS fan out there. Yes, you're not going to hear about this on MLSsoccer.com, but if you go to the other means, if you go to the players column, the pl- a lot of them are player reps. A lot of popular players in cities are player reps. Just go on rds.ca. You'll see the Patrice Bernier column. And at the end of the column, if you read carefully, you can dis- you can almost understand what's going on behind the scenes. Same for Toronto, same for Vancouver, same for every single team in the league. They have player reps. And all of them, some, some of them write columns for other sports media in the mainstream. So uh, take a look and you'll find answers to your question, even if it's not on main mlssoccer.com or the first page of the mainstream those answers are out there and in the words of Patrice Bernier he is not it doesn't look good right now and he is preparing for a work stoppage yeah and this is the thing is that they what would need to happen and what was pointed out to me yesterday is that the possible long shot that people aren't considering right now is that another major players union whether it be the NHLPA, whether it be the NFLPA, whether it be the NBA, whatever their pay PA is, uh, might step in and might add some support to MLS players because they will feel that their interests um, are are the same. Mm-hmm. So they'll understand that MLS players don't make as much money. So if there's money that comes in from a, from a larger players union, that would allow the MLS players strike fund, which a strike fund is what a union pays its workers while they are – striking and if you've ever been in a strike position you'll understand that that usually means something that's close to uh it's not much usually i know that in the one time that i was in a strike position that i would have made um it was two hundred dollars a week for the first four weeks and then it went up to four hundred dollars a week after that which seems ironic that it would be that opposite yeah. but they figured that the longer that the strike goes the more they need to tap into the resources because most unions are big right they go beyond the the people that are just negotiating, which is essentially what we're talking here, is that they get help from someone else. Uh, they might be able to get something in the line of 50% of the player's salary available to them, which will allow them to stay in a work stoppage a little bit longer than if they're getting 10% in a work stoppage. So that's sort of what the, the long shot idea is that they that might happen here. It's like Because let's face it, like we all understand the economics here, that if the MLS players um, are only getting 10% or 20% of their income – how long are they going to be able to survive on that? A month, maybe? Yeah. But uh, but I and still then, believe, Dwayne, that the idea you had a couple of weeks ago, the idea or the, the scenario you put out a couple of weeks ago where there'll be a one or two game work stoppage between the first game but just before the first game in Florida. So uh, I think that timetable is still possible. Absolutely. The other scenario that I'll leave it with this that I've considered in the last few days that makes some strategic sense than players is to start the season without a CBA in place. They continue to operate under last year's CBA, which would mean that the teams would be operating under a three point one million dollar salary cap, that they would have the you know, the thirty player rosters, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that could change in the middle of the season. But uh, that would be a situation where the basically the players would be trying to force the owner's hand into making them lock them out because then they could Again, they're in a strike position. They can have a vote at any time and pull their services. And, and that would allow them, if the owners allowed them to go into the season, that would allow them to to save, to save money, to to be make decisions about where they're living, to make decisions about what they're buying, to make decisions, decisions about how they're living, which would allow them to maybe stretch that work stoppage out longer. There is, There are lots of strategic reasons and factors involved here, and it, it all basically comes down to understanding – basic labor concepts, which is why I thought we'd have this conversation today. And anyway, Kevin, to, oh, to, sorry, go ahead. To wrap it up quickly and to make the beginning of the show fit with the, with the end of the show, Dwayne, I just hope that Montreal doesn't go through freaking Pachuca without having a work stoppage and having them to forfeit to, to the semifinal of the CONCACAF Champions League. Which, yeah, that gets real complicated in that case because you can't use replacement workers 
uh, in, in Quebec by Quebec labor law. So I don't know. They'd have to play both legs on the road and play, basically play their academy kids would be the only way they could play it. And even that, I bet you some of the academy kids would have issue with that. Anyway, ways off that. We'll see. Um, I don't have a lot of hope right now. I don't know if you have a lot of hope right now. It sounds like Patrice Bernier doesn't have a lot of hope right now. Which is that? Which is a, that's what the they've been told, right? It's a it's a, line, a party line that usually all the refs have the same one. So it's not just Patrice Bernier. He's just an example of the thirty uh, the, the the twenty MLS refs that do exist. All right. Once again, our special edition has lasted close to an hour. And Kevin, say say goodbye. <laughs> until next week. Have a great soccer, people.